interesting and fun webinar on user experience and design. And I have with me Alex Pineda, who is up bright and early today. He's based out of San Francisco, and he's our creative director. I also have Kevin Van Avery, who's um, our senior consultant, who works with a lot of clients on their, you know, their large system projects. And Kevin, I don't even know where you are. Where are you today? Uh, I'm actually also on the West Coast. I'm uh, I'm in Seattle this week. Oh yes, okay. So you're in Seattle. So um, Kevin Kevin often travels. So this is really the Alex and Kevin show. So let's go ahead and get started, Alex. So you a couple want to do some of housekeeping the, items. Yes, we always start with housekeeping items. I believe, and I have Brian Clark, by the way, who's my director of business development, who is staffing this webinar, and I have Leah Monica, who is my director of marketing, who is tweeting and monitoring the webinar. So Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, everyone is muted so that as you know, dogs start barking, police cars, you start zooming by, it won't disrupt the webinar. If you do have questions, submit them via the chat in Zoom, and Brian will let me know that we've got questions. Uh, within, I'm looking at the questions and the uh, chat tab. So anyone has any technical issues, let us know. Yes, so if you've got any issues, let us know. The slides and the recording will be sent out in the next 48 hours. We hope that this is of great interest to you all. And um, if you want to share the slides with others in your organization, if you want to um, watch the recording again, we hope that you'll do that. And then after the webinar, please give us some love, give us some comments. You can send out, we will send out everything so you can give us a feedback via the email, but give us some love or give us some feedback on social media. We're on almost all the platforms at Matrix Group. So I'm at, on Twitter, by the way, at JM Pineda. Go ahead, Alex. So, I, you know, many of you are clients on, the, um, on this webinar today, but we have a number of you who are not Matrix clients. So let me just spend two minutes introducing us. We're a digital agency based out of Arlington, Virginia. Uh, been in business 20 years, <clears throat> and we work almost exclusively, but not entirely, with associations and nonprofits, very heavy on the trade associations, the professional societies, and the nonprofits. And these organizations really hire us to solve one or more of these four problems, to increase membership or reverse some type of membership decline, retain members through compelling web and mobile offerings. Um, we have some clients that we find today are really experiencing a great deal of success with their membership, while others are struggling a little bit. They might be seeing a slow decline, or maybe they've got really high churn among their membership. So on a regular basis, they're having to really replace those members. Many of our clients today are rebranding, um, just with the environment that they find themselves in, um, with maybe some disruptions in their industry, they're really rebranding, trying to reach new audiences, trying to really clarify their position in the marketplace. And then finally, um, you know, many of you really look to us to integrate your back office systems, make it easier to do the things that you do, and you know, streamline the, relate, the, the connections and the integrations between your CMS, your AMS, your LMS, your community platform, et cetera, you know, and just make it a, an easier experience for your staff. Go ahead, Alex. So, um, and these are the services that we use to accomplish those four goals. It starts with strategy and branding, moves into design, we implement content management systems, e-commerce systems, we have our own association management software, Matrix Max. Um, we tie it together you know, with, with really good messaging, copywriting, et cetera. We help clients with their mobile app development, and then we, we, on a regular basis, are really helping clients to understand the effectiveness of the things that they're doing by looking at their analytics on a regular basis. So if you are looking to kind of take your web presence or your digital presence to the next level, if you feel like, eh, we got a, a website, but I'm not sure it's doing, you know, what it could be doing for us, if you feel like, if you are certainly, if you're in the middle of a redesign, if you're looking for a new member, membership database, or you just feel like somehow the, 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 the journeys between your systems aren't quite right, we hope that you'll give us a call. So let's go ahead and get started with the webinar. Thank you. So this webinar really came about because, you know, we, we have conversations on a regular basis here at Matrix Group about what's happening with user experience. And we always say, it's all about user experience. The company with the best user experience wins. The association with the best user experience is really gonna capture the hearts and minds of, of, of its members. 
so you know about once a year we do something related to user experience and design because you might have the most amazing you know kind of functionality on your website but then but unless it's usable unless it's seamless unless it's beautiful these days you know it, it's really going to fall flat so we decided to do this and i've got you know the the experts with me today so here's our agenda we're going to talk about user experience and trends and what this means for you next slide alex so um, Alex also happens to be a professor um, at, a, at an art at the Art Academy in San Francisco. So, so Alex, go go professor mode. <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, when I introduce, you know, what a use, what user experience means to my students, you know, I try to point out that there's two words here. It's the user, which uh, I, I I really particularly hate that word. Um, there's only two industries that have that treat their customers like users. There's like the illegal drug industry and the web. Um, right. So what about customer experience? I prefer customer Member, experience. Member, right. Member experience, exactly. Uh, and then what is an experience? It's something that, that you, that it's an uh, expansion of awareness over time. And then it affects you in some way, whether it's <clears throat> in a fairly superficial way or in a fairly profound way. And so when we're talking about you know, what user experience is. It basically encompasses all aspects of the customer's members interaction with the company, its services, and its products. And so their perception of you, your company, your brand, how much they love you, how much they hate you, all depends on their, their uh, what we call touch points uh, across all of your various, you know, services, whether it's talking to someone on the phone, they used your web app, they went to your website, they saw your ad in a magazine. We also, I, like, I also like to call it the brand experience, you know, because these experiences that they have all form their perceptions and opinions of your brand. And so in order to, you know, achieve high quality user experience, there must be, a, this is part that I particularly like, a seamless merging of the services of multiple disciplines. So that means, you know, user experience is not strictly in the purview, of course, of designers. It's also in the purview of, um, information architects, the marketing group, the, the, the design group, of course, uh, as well as the engineers. All of, we all have to work together. Of course, that's the thing we like about Matrix is that we, we're, we're really an integrated shop, that we do everything you know, in-house. We don't farm out. We don't contract out the back-end stuff. We try to do it all, to, all. And generally, when we're working with clients, we do all aspects of those things, and that really enables us to do a very seamless merging of all of these various you know, disciplines. Uh, and then the other thing I want to point out with user experience is that, you know, this is something that, that is by design. So my favorite definition of, by, of design, going back to professor mode, is that something has a plan, that, it, there's, that there's a will, that there's purpose and intent and uh, planning behind it. And so when you're crafting, when you're designing your user experience, what sort of experience do you want them to have? When we're working with our clients, we like to tell them, we, we like to ask, what is it that when your members or your customers come to the website, what is it that they want to do? But also, what is it that you, the organization who's designing this website, want them to do? So this is all, in, it's all intentional, right? So what kind of experience you want them to have? And ultimately, what are the things that you want them to do? What are they, their calls to action? And what are your calls to action? Because ultimately, if these customers and members don't do the things that you want them to do when they're, they're on your website, you know, it's, it's kind of a fail. So here are some, some talking points. Uh, a well-designed user interface could raise your, these are all from you know, various sources. It could raise your conversion rates up to 200% and a better UX design could yield up to 400%. Judgments on website credibility. That's something that we encounter a lot with when we're working with clients is well, how do I establish my credibility as the expert, as the leader, as the voice of an industry? Um, and a lot of it is based on the overall look and feel, right? Do you come across as, as authoritar uh, authoritative, as, as the leader, as the expert? Um, and then 88% 80, of online users are less likely to, re to, return to, a, to return to a site after a bad experience, and that's getting even worse. I mean, uh, these days, the patience of users is getting it, it's just like turning into nanoseconds in terms of their, their tolerance of a bad experience online. If something sucks, if something's slow, if something is confusing, they're just gonna bounce. There's a lot of alternatives. There's a lot of you know, other places that they can go. 
spend their money, spend their time, um, spend maybe spend their membership dollars. So if your if your member experience, your customer experience across all of your your platforms sucks, then that is a, a very very bad thing. And these the, these and these decisions that they make are done in instantly. You know, there's the initial first impression. That's something that we like to work with our clients quite a bit. It's like, what is the first impression that someone has on your website when they come to it for the first time, especially when you're trying to recruit new members, when you're trying to entice people to do something, you know, it's, what is that first impression? And a lot of it is subconscious. A lot of it is, you know, just your first initial, like when you're, you know, when you're speed dating, right? This is the speed dating uh, analogy. So you're speed dating, you meet someone for the first time, you make an instant judgment based on how they look, uh, how tall they are, are they skinny or fat, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a very important thing that we have to craft very carefully is in terms of what is the initial impression that someone has so they don't turn away in that nanosecond of decision making. Um, and then retailers have lost to a tune of 2.6 billion in sales every year because their site was found to be too slow for the user, especially on mobile. Um, you know, this is, this is especially key. You know, we really, really try to optimize, uh, and this is something that we're going to talk about in a bit, especially with progressive web apps, is, you know, how do we optimize the experience so that, you know, people are waiting for that loading sign or they're, you know, otherwise they're just going to bounce because it's, you know, it's too well, slow. Alex, especially in yeah. You know, I, I have a comment here. I mean, we're working with a client right now that's trying to really improve its meeting registration form. And there's a report in their membership database that shows them people who have abandoned, and it was a shocking number of people who abandoned. And mm. we think some of it had to do with usability. It was a, just a really pretty long, miserable experience, and often you got lost. You just didn't know where to click next. And at some point, people got to be really committed to continue with the journey, right? Otherwise, they just abandon. And how many times have I talked to someone who said, Oh yeah, I couldn't figure it out. And oh, now it's too late to register. Now it's too late to make the purchase. And so that's a lost sale. So let's yep. keep going. We know, you know, user experience really, really su is super important. But you're going to share with us some latest design trends. And trends are really interesting, right? Because they kind of represent the aesthetic of the time, but they also represent kind of user expectations or, or customer expectations about kind of the, the, the things that they can expect and, and, and experience? Uh, it's also like trends are also quite often a result of inflection points between um, culture and technology. You know, a, a lot of times trends are be, become possible because of innovations of technology. Think about, you know, the recent like AR, VR sort of trends that have come up in the last few years is because the technology has gotten to the point where it's you know, a viable experience and it's viable financially, like people can actually afford to have these kinds of experiences and they're not onerous to develop for the content creators. So those, that's also why these trends, a lot of these trends come about. So yeah, so this is uh, like we do every year, we do, we put together a quick list of the latest design trends. Um, you know, in this case, uh, the, the, the sort of group, the, the, the group that we came, that we put together has, has both fairly profound implications and some of them are just you know they're just fun <laughs> so I, but we just tend to see them everywhere so uh, the first one uh, that we're going to talk about are progressive web apps um kevin you want to tackle this one yeah what the heck yeah. is a progressive web app kevin yeah. <laughs> sure i can talk about that yeah progressive web apps are uh progressive web apps i think are in a lot of ways uh one of the directions that uh apps are going to go in the future especially for common apps that we use a lot a progressive web app is, uh, so most of us on this call are probably using an Android or an Apple phone or, or some other variant where we download apps from an app store and we install them. Um, a progressive web app is an app that has all the same functionality you'd expect from an app like that, except instead of running it from the app store or installing it, we run it from the uh, we run it from our web browser and so what that means is that it is uh, platform agnostic in a way that is uh, that is very cool very flexible and very future proof um, you can design a single application in um, you know in JavaScript and run it on a desktop on an Android phone on an iPhone and uh, it 
can use all of the same features you would expect from an app, like local storage, GPS, it can access your camera, um, it can access your contacts and important things like that. Um, the, the reason to use a progressive web app over a mobile app is um, it's, it's similar to the same reason you would work on a responsive uh, style for your website or a responsive design for your website. And if you've worked on a project like that, what you're trying to do is present the same website in a couple of different formats. A progressive web app allows you to present a single workflow or a single application across a couple of different devices. So applications like Uber, Spotify, and Instagram are like great examples because they have a single uh, small focused thing. You know, each of those do really one thing, play music, find a car, um, but you can have slightly different views depending on uh, whether you have a broad view of a desktop app, whether you have location sharing on your phone, and give you give yourself slightly different different options to work with. And there are big advantages to a progressive web app over a mobile web app just besides being portable. The Uber one is interesting. If you have a chance, you can download m.uber.com and save it, just uh, that URL to your phone. And that's how you install any progressive web app, is you go to the browser and most of your functions will have an add to home screen function for a web page, and that essentially saves the app locally. You know, it saves a little bit of HTML and a little bit of JavaScript, and they're extremely lightweight. The Uber app, and this kind of goes to our point about design beyond the website, as opposed to just designing the layout of the app and where the buttons go, it's designed to run over 2G. Um, the app loads extremely fast, no matter how bad your connection is. And that's because they designed it for an international audience in places around the world where we don't have uh, the ubiquitous cell phone coverage we take for granted in major cities, um, you can still run Uber and still call a car even if you have an extremely limited connection. Um, Starbucks uses a progressive web app that saves their, uh, their menu locally to your system just as a flat text file. A text file is extremely cheap in terms of storage, you know, it's a few bits. And so you can browse their menu when you're offline, offering you some of the offline availability of an app. And when you get back to the internet, you can you know, find your local Starbucks or place an order on order as you wish. Um, depending on the use case that you want to, you want to achieve, a progressive web app can be a, a really easy and affordable way to get an application-like experience that works for works for a number of different users. You know, this could be used for anything from uh, member registration to interactions with your AMS. Uh, certification platforms are, are great targets for a progressive web app. There are lots of different ways to implement this, uh, not just in a, a commercial sense, but as, as uh, um, for the association world as well. Um, Alex, did you want to show the, the Spotify app? I saw that you had it up there. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, this, I just show this because this is my favorite uh, progressive web app. As you can see, this doesn't feel like a website. For me, and, and Kevin gave a much more detailed exp uh, explanation, but for me, a progressive web app is sort of in between uh, an a uh, an application and a website. I mean, it it's a website. They use web tools, but it feels like an app and it's designed to a large degree like an app. So if you look at this interface now, this doesn't feel like a website. This feels like the Spotify app. You've got a play bar down here that plays all the tunes. You can you know, uh, do a play cue. There's volume controls over here. I can choose to, if I wanna, where I wanna listen to, uh, to this. There's my library, there's my search, there's my home. This is all the terrible music that I listen to. <laughs> uh, and then I can also install the app if I want. But what are the reasons why I use this instead of uh, the, the app? You know, sometimes I use this when, um, People would use this if they're on a work computer. You're not supposed to install Spotify on a work computer, but hey, if I just type in this URL, open at Spotify.com, I can I, I have a Spotify-like experience. Or if I'm at the, the, the on, a, on a computer in the computer lab at school, it doesn't have Spotify on it, but I can open this up. So, and what I like that when when I why I use it on a desktop versus a mo you know I also have it on my phone is when I'm looking at um, uh, artists, they have bios. Like you can click this right here, and I don't really like reading on my phone very much, but I like reading about artists and learning about new musicians and stuff. And so I go to this biography page, and this is where I can read their bio. So I'd much rather do this on a on a desktop experience than on my phone. 
So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, Alex and Kevin, there's another really important reason, and that is, you know, what we're finding in some cases is the cost to maintain a mobile, a separate mobile app you know, it just kind of mounts over time, right? So we've got clients that have mobile apps, and there's still many, many good reasons to have a mobile app. But you got to keep them really tuned and updated. And so when next, you know, when iOS 13 comes out, you got to make sure that the app is working. So you basically have double development efforts sometimes. Um, we also have found that Apple in particular is getting a little tougher with submissions to the, the Apple Store. So with yeah. a progressive web app, you can have a an app-like experience that you can actually install on your phone, but bypass the store. So there's there there are there, there's obviously design considerations because you got to design for the for a kind of a traditional website plus you know design for the the the, the app experience and there's and um, and then there's a development, but often you save on the development costs because it's really kind of one set of functionality that you're working on and then kind of, you know, expanding out to, to different interfaces. Yeah. And that's why you Google, these are very popular with Google and they actually have some recommendations about their guidelines about what makes a good progressive app. And usually they're focused on a single workflow or a single small set of work like related workflows, as opposed to trying to make your whole website experience into a, into a progressive app. Right. Um, if you, if you want to try, if anybody on the call would like to try some progressive apps, it's really easy to do. They're very, as I said, Google really um, has, has started deploying a lot of these. If you go to the weather or flights or translate or, or most of the other Google services, I think some of the more complicated ones like maps and things like that don't quite do this and save them to your phone, like the URL from the browser. Uh, what you'll be saving is a progressive web app. And um, we're going to talk about a little bit about design systems later on in this webinar. And uh, you, you'll, you'll find the, the, what, the, what you download and save to your phone is, is very familiar and uh, is similar to a web page, but that's actually a progressive web app that, that Google's deploying and gives you some of the functionality that you would expect to like look up your location in the weather or um, to use the microphone for the translate and stuff like that. Okay, Alex, we got to keep going. We got a lot to cover. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so the next uh, web trend that I want to talk about is something called inclusive design. Um, there's been a lot of like blank design that has been thrown out, you know, lately. Uh, certainly in the last few years, whether it's experience design, mobile design, uh, user experience design, you know, all that kind of stuff. And this is a fairly somewhat new one. I mean, uh, the idea of inclusive or you know the UK government called it uh, universal design has been around for quite a while and the basic principle behind it <clears throat> is that you design for as many users as possible rather than being exclusionary whether consciously or unconsciously you want to you know craft experiences that are as inclusive as possible um, Microsoft has lately been a big champion of this they've got a whole section on their website about inclusive design and they've also you know allow you to download a bunch of toolkits to, to help you determine whether uh, your website or your mobile experience is in, has you know, follows certain inclusive design principles. Um, and for me, the, the bit, one of, the, one of the, my first experiences with, with this concept is when Matrix was, was, we were designing a website for the ARC. It's the Autism Research Center. And so th th that was the first time that I'd ever consciously thought about people honestly, people with disabilities and the, what, what kind of experiences they have on the web and their reactions to it. And I learned that people who have, you know, whether, and certainly people on the, on the, on the spectrum of autism, there are some who are very functional and some who are very non-functional. Um, what kind of things, you know, what kind of uh, reactions they have to certain things on certain websites. So for example, uh, people with autism get easily overwhelmed. You know, if you have a lot of stuff flying across the screen, a lot of blaring okay. colors, using the blink tag everywhere, you know, whatever. Yeah, they, 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 it can shut them down, right? And so they need, uh, they require a, a great deal of space, a great deal of negative space in order to process information. Um, and then, um, so yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like that that we learned, uh, you know, when dealing with, when designing for people with autism. And then for me, the other thing that really brings it home is whenever I'm, you know, helping my, my mom at home, you know, uh, at her home, deal with stuff on the web, right? She's, she's in her 80s and she, she can't see very well. 
And so, you know, she needs like when I went, uh, we, we got her an iMac. And so I set the font on the iMac really huge <laughs> just so she can read stuff. It's, and it's better for her to read, you know, without her glasses. It's more comfortable for her. But that nevertheless, when you, when you go to websites, you know, a lot of times the text is too small and they kind of disable, you know, enlarging the text. And so I find that to be a very problematic practice, especially for my mom, you know, and the idea behind uh, inclusive design, and this is uh, an inclusive design checklist here, right? So there's, um, for, so for example, and whether it's people, you know, who are very disabled or people who are just somewhat disabled, there's, there's kind of a spectrum here as well. So in this, uh, in this slide over here, it shows you, um, you know, there's the, the, the total, target audience for people on the web actually falls within this triangle. And so you have 21% of users with no difficulties whatsoever. Those are like the perfect users. They have perfect eyesight, perfect caring, whatever. And they have 16% so have minimal difficulties, whether like me, I have slightly impaired eyesight or, you know, some people who are slightly hard of hearing, then it goes to mild difficulties and severe difficulties, right? And so what are we, how are we crafting our experiences and allowing for people who fall more in this giant chunk here in the middle of the pyramid to have great user experiences, to have, to provide them the features and the functions that enable them to actually, you know, have a great experience. And this progressive checklist over here, I'm sorry, this, uh, the inclusive design checklist, you know, I found to be very helpful. So one of the first things you talk about is content for alternatives, right? A lot of people are featuring video content on their, on their website these days. Is there a basic alternative, whether it's alt, you know, or images or, or video? Is it alt text a transcript? Do you have a transcript for your video? Is there an audio description or sign language? Is it the content accessible? You know, and even if and even if you are providing a transcript, right? I can like when I think back to my mom, like is the transcript in a big enough font? Can I make the font bigger so she can read it? Can you reposition where the trans or the closed captions or the transcript is? So. I can have it alongside the video when I want when I'm watching, so I have a better experience. This is a good one here. Consider hey, the Alex, situation. Yeah. Yeah, Alex, we got to keep moving. We're, oh, we oh, gotta, oh. Yeah, sorry, what we'll that. do is we'll 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 send the checklist to folks. <laughs> and I just want to. I know Alex goes into yeah, professor yeah. mode and waves three-hour seminars. Um, yep. so, so one thing that I just will say about this is this 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 kind of intersects clearly with Section 508, which is the government regulations about creating right. websites that are you know, com compatible, right? And there are different levels. So often we'll have conversations with clients about what level of compliance do you need to be at the highest level? It is very constraining as to what we can do. And it also, it can get, get expensive. But nevertheless, even if you're not required, there are certain things that you can be doing to make sure that you're more inclusive. So even things like allowing the font to be made bigger and making sure that your contrast is high enough, like I don't know, Alex, Alex and I, I talk about this with the designers, like this business of gray on white is really pretty awful, but somehow <laughs> designers, you know, designers and architects really love it. So we have, you know, raging conversations and arguments at the office here. So anyway, so I think that the thing here is just in terms of what this means for you is think carefully about your audiences. And it's not just the folks who are blind, but the folks maybe who are a little bit, a um, little bit older, maybe have a little bit of impairment, as, and certainly depending on your target audiences, you may really have to cater to them. So we'll send the principles along. So why don't we keep moving, Alex? Alex? Sorry, um, yeah, this is fixed menu. So this is something that we've been, um, you know, featuring and using pretty, pretty exclusively uh, on all our websites recently. Basically a fixed menu is um, a menu that stays in place, uh, no matter where you are, you know, scrolling up and down, left and right. Um, it's a menu that's always there. Um, and then it's, you know, basically enables the user to have the navigation available at all times. Um, this is something obviously that we, that's taken from the software world, but it's now, you know, pretty much ubiquitous, you know, increasingly on the website, on the, on the web in terms of having these fixed menus. And just to give you an example, um, here's a couple. So this is the NECA convention uh, website. This is a, an annual convention that uh, national electrical contractors have every year. We designed this for them. This year it's in Vegas, hence the uh, the super awesome uh, Elvis logo. <laughs> and uh, and you can see here is the the menu. In this case, is on the left, right? And their 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 uh, main website actually now features uh, a left 
navigation bar. Actually, let's show that. Let me turn that. Alex, you got to keep moving, buddy. We got lots of okay, 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 right, right, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and uh, Alex, so let was... me just before you hang on before you keep going. We we just got a comment, yeah. and the person said we may also keep in mind the audience. If the audience is generally healthy and of working age, 20 to 60 or so, the small number of folks who wander into the site may not justify the expense and constraints. And that's absolutely right. It's always that's true. a yeah. Um, you know, it's always a, you know, kind of a judgment call and you obviously weigh the, weigh the pros and cons. And like I said earlier, depending on what kind of compliance you want to achieve, sometimes it can get really pricey. And so obviously clients have to make decisions about that. That's right. It's always, these are always cost and benefit uh, analysis and these decisions are made, you know, in, in every, you know, context. So, yeah. So uh, the next thing, big typography. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this a lot on the web now. Um, so why has it become popular all of a sudden? One is because our desktops are huge, right? You know, when, when you get a new computer straight out of the box, uh, these things, these monitors are already set to really, really high resolutions, like 2,500 pixels wide, you know, HD mode. And so you kind of need big type in order to send a big message. <laughs> But I think maybe to some degree, it's also like, um, you know, it, it's just a, 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 a design sort of trick. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, you usually, when you come to a website or even, or even an application, you have the big, what's called the hero image or the branding area at the top, and you just send a single image and then you just have one message, especially for software companies like Spotify, or in this case, like um, Webflow, you know, what are the three things when you come to their website? What is it? What are the three things that what is, what is it that they want you to know? It's design, build, launch, beyond hosting, create tomorrow's world. But then even like Huffington Post is, is is employing the big type these days to really sort of big get the message across to your eyeball so you can possibly miss it. And so when you if you if you're thinking about and we do this for our clients as well. And sometimes I think less I try to counsel them that less is more. You know, don't put a whole paragraph on the top of your hero image. Just have a very simple, strong, you know, text uh, you know, blurb there. Just, even if it's just like four words, you know, what is it that you want to get across? You know, when people come to the website and start, you know, their eyeballs start traveling down, what is the first thing that they want that you want them to see in a very simple, clear way? Oh, dark mode. Okay, okay. So this is really cool. Uh, I just learned about this from one of our one of my web developers. So. And I don't know if you guys are aware that on uh, on both Mac OS and Windows now, you can set your desktop OS to either light or dark mode. And, and you, you can see how, phone. yeah, you can do it on your phone. Um, so you can see like, you know, all the browser Chrome that I have here on this, on my Chrome browser uh, is actually dark because I like, I prefer the sort of the dark mode. But now using CSS, a website can actually detect if you are in light or dark mode and this uh, this screenshot here is showing you you know the same website in light and dark modes and it's actually just me switching uh the browser from light to dark i'm oh, sorry the os from light to dark here let me show you let me show you what that looks like do i have time to show that okay probably. yeah yeah you, you're just really fast okay hold on a sec and you know this becomes a preference right there's some folks who find yeah. it more comfortable to go into dark mode and again it's part of accessibility it's part of just creating the experience that that allows you know your members your customers to really customize it to their own preferences look at that what yeah. <laughs> and you can do it on so, your I mean, phone if you've got a yeah. if you've got a phone you just click the you know the, the 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 menu button at the bottom like three times and it goes into dark mode right and so the implications are one we have to design if, if you actually want to take advantage of this feature um whether whether it's for you know a branding state standpoint or usability standpoint or just cater to people's preferences you know the implications are that we just have to design for both modes you know, and sometimes it's fairly straightforward. It's just like reversing the text, but other times, you know, like link colors and stuff like that. It's uh, you know, it's, it's a bit more work. So dark mode, and then uh, the next one is glitch art is back. 
What is glitch art, Alex? <laughs> glitch art was really popular, like in the '90s, like with Club Flyers and you know some more like uh, cutting edge brands and and whatever. And and it's sort of like a play on like when you're watching a video and there's like a glitch, right? It's like you're watching you know an old school like interlaced video, and then there was like a problem, and then the the video would glitch out, and that was kind of intentional, right? That they would do this as part of an effect. I don't know if you guys have ever have watched. Um, uh, a show that really features that a lot is uh, Mr. Robot. They mm -hmm. do a lot of those glitch right. effects a lot, like when he's when he's like, you know, because uh, he's he has some, some 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 mental problems, and so like when he's going through life, he thinks he's he's actually doing one thing, but then it glitches, and it shows like, oh wait, this is like what I'm actually doing, and that was in my fantasy world. And so um, so then what? And this is very much tied to the '90s. Um, and so I'm seeing this a lot with in terms of you know, there's an increasing amount of nostalgia experiences that you have on the web. I don't know if people here are into, uh, have watched Stranger Things, yep. my favorite show on the web. Okay, so initially, when the, the creators were going to do this show, they're, every year they were going to they have it in a particular decade, right? So it started off in the 80s, then it was going to be 90s, but because the response for the 80s was so intensely powerful, they decided to keep the whole show in the 80s. And that shows you like the, the, the nostalgia effect that, uh, that, you know, in this case um, with glitch art, people are bringing back for whatever reason, you know, and, and this is something that you can use to, to great effect. If you understand your audiences and understand their, their demographic information, for example, if these are, you know, children of the 90s, you can employ glitch effects to, to, to great effect, you know, uh, no pun intended. To, to, to have that kind of resonance with that particular audience because it's something that they remember whether from their childhood or teen, teen years. Um, same thing when people are using like 80s motifs and stuff like that. Um, it's a very powerful, you know, sort of draw to, for people to, to come into because it's something that they remember quite fondly, you know, in their history. So, Glitch Art is back. And then um, custom, this is something that you see quite a lot these days. It's custom illustration as the brand voice. Um, I, I'm a, I'm an Airbnb host, and so I'm on my Airbnb quite a lot, you know, as a host. Uh, and then um, they use, I noticed because it's, um, you know, with Airbnb, your customers and your hosts are pretty much global, right? This is a global company. And so they use illustration a lot to, one, convey a certain sense of whimsy, to convey, um, you know, the sort of brand personality of Airbnb, which is kind of, you know, they try to be playful. But it's also because illustrations are somewhat universal, right? I mean, they can, when you use a, a photograph of people, you've already placed them in boxes. Like, okay, this one's Asian American, this is African American, they're third in age, they're gender boxes. But with illustration, to a large degree, you can transcend those, those boxes and have come, ac you know, come across as a much more sort of universal message. And certainly like with uh, like MailChimp, we use a lot of MailChimp for our clients. You know, their, their brand is based on the illustration of the chimp. And they use illustrations to great effect in terms of conveying both a narrative and a brand message. Um, and so that's something that, you know, people don't necessarily consider. And there is a certain cost involved because, you know, you don't want to come across too much as, you know, oh, this is just a, a clip art illustration. You want it to be fairly custom. You know, I, I know quite a few people that work at Airbnb and they, they actually employ um, their own illustrators to create these. So they're all custom illustrations and you can hire custom illustrators for that. But it really provides, you know, it's something to think about as an alternative to using, you know, photography, especially stock photography, um, and in, in, in terms of, you know, crafting a, a fairly unique brand voice. Uh, and a lot of our clients have actually used that. Like, remember um, uh, the uh, direct selling DSA? They, they, they use illustration quite a bit on their, on their, on their, on their website. Um, and then you can see it on their 404 pages. I just particularly like their, their 404 pages are pretty funny. Like you, like for Slack, if you get a 404, you have this like panorama of this nature scene of like these floating islands and stuff. And then MailChimp uses this like donkey or donkey with its head and with a hole in the ground is really funny. Anyway, okay. So then um, subtle animation related to Airbnb. Um, Airbnb has put out a, uh, uh, this thing called Lottie. Uh, let me pull that up. Oh, I have it up. Hold on a second. 
One interesting note is that a lot of uh, 404 pages now, if you uh, if you have a second, will run little games on them. I don't know if anybody yeah. else has noticed that. Those are often progressive yeah. web apps, to go back to our earlier conversation. That's right. Um, so, yeah, so um, especially now that Flash is dead, um, so you're, there's there's got to be other ways in order to get, like, uh, animations, uh, to get, you know, movement on a website. Uh, and unfortunately, um, you know, usually you have to resort to, right, you know, currently, mostly you have to resort to using animated GIFs, which are huge in file size because you're basically saving a whole bunch of frames into a single image, or you're using embedded video, which also has its own sort of drawbacks. But with this, uh, this um, uh, library uh, called Lottie from Airbnb, you can basically import like Adobe After Effects files for like text animation, vector animations, and then turn them uh, in using uh, JSON uh, uh, at, with body moving and renders them natively on mobile and on the web, especially if you're using vector files. You can create these really cool animations and they're pretty lightweight. It doesn't add a lot of download to, to the experience. And so this is something that I hope really, really catches on, you know, in terms of people using it a lot more is employing this sort of thing. Because it can be, you know, very, very cute and subtle. Like if you look at these illustrate uh, of these examples here, you can see like the animation going on here with like the loading screen and you know doing a um, a tutorial for people and using this kind of animation uh, sort of uh, technique instead of using you know just like boring screen capture stuff. Um, you know, I gotta keep moving here. And then last one, variable fonts. This is something that I really, 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 really hope catches on. This is something that was announced back in 2016 by. Uh, the biggest type players on the market, uh, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Adobe. It's a, um, uh, excuse me, it's a, a consortium of people who are trying to basically allow variable fonts to be used in, in web browsers. And what a variable font is, is, you know, right now when, you're, when you use type, uh, when you embed a typeface uh, on the web, you're, you're using a specific call for a particular typeface. And the amount of variety, you know, that you can employ on that font is pretty limited and it has to be hard coded into the CSS. But with variable fonts, basically you can have a single typeface and there's essentially unlimited possibilities in terms of variations of that font. So a brief comparison, this sort of, this sort of shows you the, the matrix in which the, uh, a typeface can be, can be altered and, and changed using variable font, the vari vari sorry, variable font um, platform. Um, so an example is Roboto. It's a pretty, you know, everybody knows Roboto probably. It's a Google's main font. Uh, it's got, it's a pretty good typeface. It's got uh, quite a few variants and so there's 12 font files. There's also like Roboto Sans and Ro Roboto Slab. Um, so, but you have basically 12 font files and 12 variants, but with variable fonts, you have one single font file and unlimited variants. You can basically take a single font file and alter it in like a ridiculous number of ways. So here's an example you know, from Access Praxis, a, 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 font, a typeface called Decobar. And you can see here all the different ways that you can mess around with this font. You can see it all happening here with this one up here. So you can make it rounded. You can make it a uh, slab, which color, is amazing. You can, you can take the color. Out. Yeah. In line. I mean, it's, God, it would be so amazing if we could just do that. Rather than having to, to specify, like, you know, in hard-coded CSS style, you just take a single typeface and you just basically enter like a numerical values for all of these uh, aspects of the typeface. It would be so amazing. Alex, what does worm skeleton mean? Sorry? What does worm skeleton mean? Oh, here, it's, it's, I don't know why people do that. It looks really weird. Well, there's worm terminal <laughs> and then there's worm skeleton. Anyway, I just thought that was funny. Yeah. All right, keep yeah. going. Flared, look at the flare, yep. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, let's get back to it. So I think uh, UX beyond website design. Yeah, so I just want to introduce experience. this. You know, yeah. it, when we're talking about user experience, we want to make sure that we're not just talking about websites, right? Often with our clients, they've got a website, but then they've got their membership database, they've got their learning management system, they've got their community platform, they've got, you know, campaign sites, et cetera. And, and so I think what happens sometimes is the vendor will say, well, just give me the style and will inherit the styles, but often that's not enough, right? To um, right. 
to, to really, you know, to, to kind of make, to, to create a really seamless experience. So why don't you go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, Kevin, there's something called design systems that you were going to talk about. Um, yeah, and that, and this goes into exactly what you were talking about before. We're not the first people to consider that we would need a cohesive design experience across multiple systems. Um, everybody on the call is familiar with a, at least one design system, I would expect. If you use an Android, uh, an iOS, or a Windows phone, uh, each one of those organizations has their own design systems. And if you have uh, a style guide or a branding guide for your organization, you are familiar, I think, with the concept behind a design system. It's a unified document that kind of defines how you how you present your organization and how you interact with users. Um, a design system really takes it a lot further. As opposed to just talking about colors, fonts, and imagery guidelines, a, a design system talks about how you structure your applications. And uh, the, the iOS, the Apple Human Interface Guidelines, are some of the most, uh, some of the most famous ones. And if you have ever used um, an Apple phone, you'll know that, for instance, the search button is always in the same place, that when you pull up a field, it pulls up the keyboard in the same way and like doesn't obstruct certain parts of the application. Um, Google has their own material design system where, uh, you know, edit things are always represented as a circle with a little pencil. Um, uh, it defines kind of how they pop up fields, how they do inline things. Um, if you look at any of the apps that you download into their phone, you'll see the way they do forms is the same in every application, uh, the way they present text, the way they present lists. Um, each of these design systems allows them to uh, you know, unify their brand and unify their user experience when they have a lot of different platforms. And so for organizations like uh, uh, like us, where we're working with AMSs, we're working with LMSs, we are working with uh, content management systems. A design system is a direction to go where uh, when we start to kind of integrate and start to pass users in between those systems more fluently, as we start to increase the amount of integration and single sign-on that all of our, our digital ecosystems possess, elements like this become more and more important to consider. Is um, again, kind of going back to the theme of the website, how do we take our user experience outside of just website design and layout on a page and taxonomy and talk about how they are interacting with our organization as a whole and how we can design that. And a design, um, a design system lets us, uh, lets us control that and create components that, that give us a, a great degree of, um, great degree of flexibility in that, in that regard. You know, and to me, design systems really are all about, think of all of your digital properties really as part of the same system and think about creating these really, like Kevin said, these fluid journeys between them. And often it means, if you go to the next slide, Alex, it often means talking to your different partners and saying, okay, here are the styles from the website and here are my design things. And often what you'll find is you have to extend your style guide so that you've got elements that are maybe only used in another system, but really still fit in line with the overall style. So for example, this is the store for the uh, Food Marketing Institute. When you go from the website to the store, you're actually crossing systems. And there wasn't a style for the, for the add to cart button or the, or the purchase button. And so because it was undefined, it was coming out as gray, which really didn't fit into the design aesthetic and also was terrible for usability because people were getting lost and not seeing necessarily the, the, the add the card button because there wasn't enough contrast. So part of the, the, the redesign was really thinking about the whole system and saying, what, what, the, what do all these other systems need in the way of styles to make everything feel unified? If you go to the next slide, same thing. Um, you've got, this is a store uh, for the sheet metal contractors and same thing, this is crossing systems and we wanted to make sure that there was a seamlessness, you know, um, between, be, between the different systems. That, so you've got like, whether it's the, 
the, the, you know, the, the kind of the angular elements or the colors or the buttons or even just the flows. So yeah, ahead. and especially not just from, you know, especially from a usability standpoint, consistency is key. Like once you've already introduced and established your interface to your audience from your homepage or interior pages or what have you, and you show like, okay, this is a link color. You've trained them, like all, all the links should be this color. All the buttons should be this color. You know, th those visual cues have already been established. And then once they go to a different system, they don't know that they've gone through this different system, right? They don't know that they've gone from your website to a third party vendor's like, e-commerce system. They don't care. They just want to buy stuff. And so, you know, you've got to keep that whole experience consistent from, especially from a usability standpoint, as well as a branding standpoint. Go to the next slide. So we're, we're running out of time, but I want to make sure that we talk about this. When we talk about user experience, one of the things that we recommend is that you define your user journeys. So basically make like an undercover member and ask yourself, what are the ways that people are traversing my systems? What are the most important journeys? It might be going from an email to a website. It might be going from an email to a website to um, to a registration system. It might be going from an e-commerce system to a learning management system. So what we say is define the most important journeys, test these journeys, and then figure out where the friction points are. What's not great? What feels jarring? What needs some love? Are, are there like some excess things? Is there labeling that needs to be fixed and then really work with your partner and your partners to make them amazing. What we often find is that these friction points really come about um, when people cross systems. And so it's really important to work with the two partners to make sure that, you know, that they're working well. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So, um, you know, before I get started, there was a comment, Alex, that maybe you can comment on, and certainly I can comment sure. on that. Um, it, it, uh, I think, Brian, can you read the comment? Uh, <clears throat> the question about uh, custom illustrations and glitch art? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, and it, I, I suspect the answer is kind of depends, but uh, Alex, Kevin, I, I don't know if you both know, but if someone wanted to add glitch art or custom illustrations or uh, the gifts and so forth, uh, you know, is that hard? Is it straightforward? Is that uh, something any organization can do uh, on the back end? Does that require um, us being involved? Um, well, in terms of glitch art, yeah, it depends. I mean, glitch art, uh, where, where, where is the, you know, first, what is the purpose of the glitch art? You know, what are you trying to achieve with it? And once you figured that out, how, you know, who's creating it? Uh, do you have design staff in house? If you don't, you know, there are certainly illustrations and, and uh, compositions that you can just purchase you know, and customize online. Same thing with illustrations. It's like with stock photography, you know, there's there's unlimited stock photography out there, but finding stock photography that is has presence, doesn't look cheesy or cliched um, is possible. You just have to look a little harder. And then with illustration, there's a lot of stock illustration out there as well. And if you find a style that you like, that doesn't look, that matches your, your company's um, aesthetic and your messaging, then you can generally per purchase illustrations, a whole bunch of illustrations within that style, especially from stock photo um, websites like Getty or iStock or what have you. So yeah, it's absolutely possible and doesn't necessarily require a lot of effort. Alex, time. there was another comment about, you know, is some of this stuff too trendy? You know, good design should be, you know, kind of more evergreen. And I I'll say something to that and, and maybe you can comment. You know, some of the, the, the trends that we're showing you we're showing you because, you know, we think it's important for, for our clients, you know, to just kind of know what's trendy. Um, but there's also, there, there, there's definitely like this blend that you have to balance of usability and unique, right, but also kind of with the time. So like when we look at a website, say from the 1990s, like we immediately look at it and say, oh my God, that's from the 1990s, right? Or like that's from the <laughs> yeah. early 2000s. So you don't want that. But you, you also, I think to, 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 to the, 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 the attendees, you know, point, you don't want to make it so trendy that within a year or two, you're like, oh my God, we've got to change this. So, uh, you know, one thing to maybe do is to figure out maybe in some of your campaigns, you can introduce some of this more trendy stuff. So for example, when, we, yeah. when we're doing convention sites, 
that's right. a great place to do some of the glitch art, the variable fonts, yep. because you know that that's like going to be around for nine months and it's going to be very au courant and then it's done. Yeah, who cares if that's timeless? That was only for, you know, one particular year anyway. Um, especially if it's you know, it, part, part of the, the theme of like, you know, the like the Elvis logo that we showed you from Nika, you know, that's only built because it's in Vegas and for that particular year, so it's appropriate. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we always end our webinars with an action plan because we've thrown a lot out at you. And for those of you that are considering redesigns, for those of you that are in the throes of a redesign, here are just some things that we'd like you to think about. So number one is how inclusive are you today? Do you want to be, do you need to be? And so have a conversation with your partner, certainly have a conversation with us. We certainly have these conversations with our clients and certainly internally to say, what are some things that we can be doing based on the audience? You know, the second thing is to ask yourself, what are your most important journeys? It might be making a donation. It might be accessing member protected content. It might be, you know, accessing the latest journey, a uh, journal. It might be um, registering for a meeting test them, which experiences are disappointing or frustrating, and then are there easy things that you can do right away? And then the fourth thing is, like, what cool design trends can you incorporate into your plans, right? You might say, boy, it would be really fun um, to, you know, try some glitch art. What does my website look like in dark mode? Uh, certainly, there are certain things that we think are, are going to be timeless, like the fixed menus, that if you don't already have, you know, that's something that can be retrofitted into a website. And then finally, as with everything, create short-term and medium-term plans with your partner so that you can be incorporating some of these trends, some of which are much more kind of for the aesthetic, and some of them really will have a great impact on the experience of your, of your customers. So we have time for a few questions. Um, Brian, are there any questions? Uh, you guys have done a great job of uh, answering the comments and the questions so forth. Uh, don't have anything queued up at the moment. Well, for those of you who have questions, please go ahead and write them, but let's go to the next slide. Kevin, did you want to say something? Actually, yeah, can I jump in real quick? I wanted to go back to one of the previous questions about the glitch art and custom illustration. Uh, Marcia, if you were asking about sort of a technical implementation for that as well, that's like a front end development skill set. So those are like HTML image files in JavaScript and CSS. So often they could be uh, implemented through a CMS like WordPress or Sitefinity. If they were very complex, uh, you would need like a, you, you might require a developer or, or some sort of uh, some sort of fed to help. Yeah. Oh, was that a question related to like animations of illustrations, like with the Lottie system for Airbnb? Then yeah, there's, that definitely requires front end development. Yeah, and 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 you know, there's there's obviously folks with um, with some really serious front end chops, you know, <laughs> and there's some things that you can do, you know, um, with, with with some easy tools. You know, we blog about this stuff, we write about this stuff, we. We're constantly doing these webinars. If you like this webinar, let us know. If there are topics you'd like us to cover in the future, let us know. You know, let us know how we did today. Did we cover what you expected us to? And um, we'll we'll definitely take questions during the webinar. We can stay on for a few minutes, but really, please be in touch. Let us know how we can help you make your user experiences, you know, amazing. Because that's really what we're in business to do. Brian, any questions? Oh, it's got uh, another one just popped up. Do you have any feedback on how much work there is in keeping up with various vendors like Google and their frameworks? Do they change them? Kevin, uh, you want to take I, that I can one? feel I... that. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, the short answer is uh, yes, they do change them, and there is work to keep up with them. Um, we always describe that as a technical debt, basically. Um, over time, um, yeah, technology continues to move along and there's a certain amount required to keep up with it, if for no other reason than to keep up with security patches. Um, it really depends on the frameworks and the level of upgrades. Um, I'd like to say there's like some sort of useful rule of thumb, but even within systems, you know, a cold fusion upgrade between version eight to nine is very different than nine to 2016. Um, a, an upgrade from, you know, version to version 5 of WordPress is, is fairly straightforward, uh, whereas in other content management systems, it can be a lot more work. Um, uh, what we, uh, it's one of the big advantages of the progressive web app is that as long as your system can run a browser and the browser has some backwards compatibility, 
it really extends, I think, the lifespan of some of these apps uh, or, or cuts down the maintenance cost, depending on how you want to phrase it, um, where you don't have to constantly redevelop and keep up with the latest versions of each native app systems and things like that to stay in the app store. You can just keep your web site up to date and keep your website patched or sorry your web server patched and and uh, still serve app like content yeah and let me just say this um, sometimes we'll go through multiple versions of any system it might be a content management system or iOS and then boom like all of a sudden things change when Apple for example introduced iOS 11 they basically said we are going to sunset a whole bunch of apps that are no longer compliant and poof like hundreds of thousands of apps just disappeared from the store because they had not been updated to work with iOS 11 uh, but that had not happened previously so you just never know Brian are there any more questions I think you guys done a great job of uh, keeping up the questions well, uh, we're you. looking good so Cool. Um, Alex and Kevin, thanks so much. And for folks on the phone, we are available to you. So here are all the ways that you can be in touch with us. You can call us, you can email us, you can send us a message on social. Um, you can come visit the new office we've just moved. So um, we'd love to help you make your uh, member and user journeys amazing. So please be in touch and have a wonderful week. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks for your time, everyone. Bye. Bye.